another team to something that I don't know. All right, where are we at? Find that doggone thing. Okay, you're talking too loudly. What happens? The the peaks on your voice voice will get clipped off, and you'll actually lose little pieces of what you're saying if you talk too loud loudly. That is a function of FM. On AM, the peaks go up, you get distortion. On FM, it clips them off. They go away. You, you scream? You know what? I'd like to do that to a lot of demonstrators. <laughs> oh. What type of tones are used to control repeaters linked by the Internet Relay Linking Project, IRLP. IRLP is a is a interconnection of repeaters. We have a repeater linking of repeaters that runs from somewhere up around New York down through New Jersey and across Pennsylvania. I can sit here and talk to people on the highways up in New York. Uh, I'm not even really sure how far it goes. I've never researched it. But what happens, this is a different type of system. This is where you can link two repeaters for just one conversation. You can say to this repeater, link to that one. You use what are called DTMF tones. That is dual tone multi-frequency. Uh, means that you have two tones together and they're at different frequencies. You all know what DTMF is. But you know it under another name called touch tone. It's the tones when you dial your phone. Most of our handheld transceivers and a lot of our mobiles have a keypad on the microphone. And that keypad, when you're holding the transmit button down, will send DTMF tones. As a matter of fact, that's how you shut a repeater down. You do that and you type in the right code. Same thing. Don't do that, please. That's, you know. But that's used for a lot of things. These are relay, these are repeaters that are linked ad hoc when you need them. The one that I'm talking about is linked all the time, or at least most of the time. You get on there at night, listen, you'll hear truck drivers going across the, uh, I can't think of the name of the bridge now, but it's one of the bridges between New York and New Jersey. Don't, don't be on there. There's a lot of truckers now that have moved from CB to uh, technicians, licenses, because they can, they can talk over long distances. They have the rigs programmed that as they're driving from, you know, like Harrisburg up to New York, they keep clicking the channel up one every time they run out of, out of a repeater, they click it up one to the next repeater. And coming back, they do the reverse. Uh, by the way, uh, the truck drivers that are on there don't sound anything like the CD crap. It's amazing. Are there still telephone interconnects on many repeaters? Very few, but there are some. By the way, some, what he's talking about is you could hit the repeater, dial in a code, and then dial a phone number and it would call and connect to that phone, make a phone call. Yeah, that sort of went away as the cell phone started to. Uh, how can you join a digital repeater's talk group? Program your radio with the group's ID or code. This is new. This is something, in, there are three different competing systems. If any of you remember VHS and, and Beta, well, this is the same thing. It is DMR, Fusion, and uh, D 
D star. I think DMR is going to be the winner. We will probably have the other two around, but that will probably be the winner. Okay. So, so there are digital repeaters up in this area in addition to analogs? Oh, yeah. In addition to what? In addition to analog. Oh, yes. Yeah. One of the things that I'm fighting right now as emergency coordinator is that we do not take down analog FM repeaters and replace them with a digital because we do not have people out there with digital radios. Yeah, we have, we probably have 40%, but what that means if we go out on an MCOM and we go on a digital repeater, 60% of our people aren't there, okay? I'm fighting that one. Uh, one of the clubs brought up a digital repeater. I don't care if they bring a new one up. It's if they bring one up and replace it. One of our clubs brought one up, but they brought it up with, and I agreed to it because there's a way that they can key in a tone and remotely reboot it in five minutes back to analog. So if we need it for MCOM, it's an MCOM second level backup. It's not one of the primaries that we typically use. But if we really need it, they can push it back to analog. So I won on that one. But your radio has to have a group's ID or code. I do not know enough about the, D the digital modes on, v on UHF and VHF to spend much time more on it other than that. There's, there's a lot of programming that's way, way over my head. Which of the following applies when two stations transmitting on the same frequency interfere with each other? Okay? Common, common courtesy should prevail. Nobody has an absolute right to an amateur frequency. Usually there's enough frequencies you can move. Okay? It, you know, it should never get into a contest. What is a talk group on a DMR repeater? This is one of the digitals. By the way, these are, these, this question and the one back are two new questions on the test. A way for groups of users to share a channel at different times without being heard by other users on the channel. DMR, one of the reasons I believe DMR is going to be the winner is because the D-Star radios have about a $200 premium for every, all everything else being equal in the radio. It's going to cost $200 more. I don't think people are going to pay that. It has no real big advantages. Fusion is great, but it provides no real big advantage other than it's digital. DMR has one big advantage, and that is you can have two conversations going on on the repeater at the same time. That is a, that's an advantage. That's, that is the reason. By the way, I do not own a D, DMR radio yet. I'll tell you what I was waiting for. I was waiting for one in a reasonable price range that would do both two and 70 centimeters. Because all the early ones would do one or the other. And I wasn't buying two radios at this point. But DMR talk groups allow you to have lots of things going on. Okay, this goes back to the old days of ham radio when we did CW. You did not send, I'm receiving interference. Think about how long that would take to send on code. You said, QRM. And oh, by the way, that is, we're still using that terminology, okay? QRM is interference. QSY, we'll hear this one once in a while. It's move to a different frequency or I'm changing frequency. One of the nice things about that is most of the press don't know what that means. So if you say QSY, 
you might, and you have a channel that you can name, they may not be able to follow you easily. There's only, I think, two or three of those that are in the thing, but, yeah. Why are simplex channels desi designated in the UHF and VHF band plans so that stations within mutual communications range can communicate without tying up a repeater? Okay, if somebody there in York, Jack, for example, not this Jack, another one, and I want to carry on a conversation for a long time. We may drop over off the repeater because our, we're close enough to each other and talk simplex. Okay? Don't rely on that as privacy, okay? But it's nice. When we do a lot of the bike races, we leave the cracker barrel up here and head up through the mountains. A lot of times we'll pick a simplex channel during that time because we are we're, we're convoy. We can talk to each other that way. And some places on the road you're in a shadow that it's not real good to get the repeater. So it's better. One of the things with ham radio is we have so many options that when one thing doesn't work, we do something, we go to plan B. C or D. And I joke that this Berry Mountain group sometimes gets to plan E before they get there. But where may SSB phone be used in the amateur bands above 50 megahertz? SSB, single side band. We're going to be seeing that acronym all through. Where may it be used in amateur bands above 50 megahertz? In at least some portion of all of those bands. I'm going to give you a distinction between FM and single side band. If you've got a good signal situation, good signal path, FM is it. It is clear understandable, you know, it's like the person sitting next to you. But when you get out on the edge, FM starts to deteriorate. Sideband is kind of nasal, it's kind of yucky to listen to in a way. But I've talked to Canada <coughs> on single sideband on two meters. And I sure as heck can't do that on FM. I don't have a, I don't have any way to do that on FM. Sideband is weak signal, long distance, bad conditions. You'll get through. It'll be nasty, maybe, but you'll get through. FM, where you can use it, it's the ideal. And I will say this. FM, as far as I'm concerned, for MCOM is better than digital. And the reason it is, is digital does not have quite the voice call quality, particularly when you do the split channels on DMR. The voice quality is not there. And let's face it, you want that thing to be understandable. If you're reading somebody's blood pressure and respiration, you definitely want the person on the other end to be able to understand it. Sideband is used and it is weak signal, long distance, bad conditions. Which of the following describes a linked repeater network? A network of repeaters where the re signals received by one repeater are repeated to all of the repeaters. This is the one I was talking about down around I have no idea how many repeaters are on that thing. Okay, you know, I've got five or six programmed in my radio that I can hit in this area. When do the FCC rules not apply to the operation of an amateur station? 
I hope that question is not one that you would miss. When do the Pennsylvania driving laws not apply when you're on a road? <laughs> okay. What is meant by the term NCS used in net operations, net control station? One of the things that we do is we have nets. We do a lot of the nets just for contact and information. Many of the nets meet on one night. SMRAs is 9 o'clock, Monday, Monday night. night. KVHF is at 8.30. We barely finish by the time to get on this one. And sometimes I don't. Uh, but the net control station is the guy who's the traffic cop for the, for the net. Different nets have slightly different protocols, but basically, if you want to talk, you address net control and you get permission. One of the funny ones is we will get Dick Goodman on the net, and Sandy is frequently in net control. She's a good one. And Dick will come on the radio. Permission to go, uh, or how is it all? He always winds up asking for permission, and it's funny because, oh, it's when she's not net control. He'll say, permission to go to, to N3 ECF, direct. Yeah, go ahead. But uh, those are, the, those are two. Net control is the traffic cop. They control what's going on to make sure people aren't transmitting at the same time, things like that. What should be done when using voice modes to ensure that the voice messages containing unusual words are received correctly? You spell the words using a standard phonetic alphabet. George, Abel, Roger, Dog, Nancy, Easy, Roger, Sugar. That used to be my address. Gardeners. Of course, I had it down fast enough that I could run it faster than anybody could figure out what it was. But, uh, yeah. You spell it using a standard phonetic alphabet. Roger, Abel, Lima, Philip, Henry. That's Ralph. Okay. Now, if you're spelling out prednisone, you might want to spell that one out phonetically. What do races and Aries have in common? We talked about races earlier. Amateur frequencies, amateur stations, amateur operators in civil or in civil defense or emergency call. Aries and races have one thing in common. Both may provide communications during emergencies. When you ask the reverse question, what are how are they different? That's where you get in trouble. Because that's where you start splitting hairs instead of talking meaningful. What does the term traffic refer to in a net operation? Formal messages exchanged by the net stations. We actually have a form that we use for formal traffic where you write it out. Any of you have IS? courses, you know, like IS 100, 200, 700, 800, IS 213, I believe it is, message form. This, we have a traffic form that hands use that's very similar to that. I'm trying to get us to move to the IS 213 so we're all using the same form. But quite frankly, if you work with the one, the other one is close enough that I don't see a, a big issue. If you learn how to use one, it's, it's just learning a couple blocks that are different. Which of the following is an accepted practice to get the immediate attention of a net control station when reporting an emergency? You begin by saying priority or emergency followed by your call sign. Priority, K3HQI. Emergency, K3HQI. Everybody who works 
any kind of MCOM or public service is supposed to know and should know, and if they went through my class, they do know, that if you hear that, you take your finger off the mic button and you don't put it back unless there's some good reason to do it, okay? I've only heard these a couple of times. And quite frankly, they've all been handled properly. Which of the following is an accepted practice for an amateur operator who has checked into the net? Normally, your net will have a check-in process. Uh, the one in Carlisle says, all the anybody with an A call, and they transmit. York does it the other way around. Anybody whose call sign begins with a, an A through F, that's the second portion of it, like K3HQI is H. Every net seems to have a little bit different protocol, but the idea is you check in on the net, and then you remain on the frequency without transmitting until asked to do so by the net control station. You'll be given an opportunity to, you know, do you have anything? You can break in if there's some priority or something of that sort. No questions asked about that. But otherwise, you sit there and listen. Which of the following is a good characteristic of good, which is it following is a characteristic of good traffic handling? Pass the message exactly as received. I always get the question, well, what if there's a word spelled wrong? If there's a word spelled wrong, you spell it out with phonetics and you spell it wrong. The guy on the other end gets it wrong. Unless you want to ask the person who wrote it, do you want to correct it? They can correct it, yes. But when you get it, you send it as received. What are amateur station control operators, operators ever permitted to operate outside the frequency privileges of their license class? Absolutely. But only if necessary in situations involving the immediate safety of human life or protection of property. In other words, the FCC actually has some rules that are common sense. Okay? And believe me, I don't care. September, or November 22, 1963, Dallas, Texas. A civilian walked down the street, and there's a police officer by the name of uh, Tibbetts, I believe, laying on the street, bleeding out. He reached in the car, picked up the mic, and said, I got a police officer shot here. The name of the shooter was Lee Harvey Oswald. It occurred shortly after Kennedy was shot. The guy was absolutely within the law, unless there was a payphone sitting there that he could have used and I will tell you that the FCC would not question that under that stressful situation that the guy didn't look for a payphone. They not down here that radio call. They what? do it. If I someone like an officer of the lead or a medic or a firefighter, grab their radio call, especially here in the county, they know where you're at. They're yes. They know who it is and the transmits are and identification right away. Yeah, yeah it's, it's better than a, than a cell phone call. Yeah. Don't forget the GPS location immediately. One of our fire policeman pressed the orange button by mistake. We call it the Sheriff's Park Transit button. <laughs> uh, do you want to know who the fire police? <laughs> it goes up all the time. Oh, oh, I didn't know that. That's why I call it the Sheriff's Park Transit button. <laughs> I reached over, grabbed the mic, and felt a button and pressed it. <laughs> that was one of those funny up on the old one with the button on the plane. Yeah, okay. Uh, And of course, that took a while to work down. And you get 10 seconds of your life being broadcast. Oh, man. But uh, 
seriously, don't ever let somebody die because you're afraid of violating some chicken shit rule. By the way, do you know why I call them chicken shit rules? Because they're worth as much as chicken shit. It's good for life. What? It's good for life. Yeah, but that's the only thing. What, inf what information is contained in the preamble of a formal traffic message? A traffic message will con consist of a preamble and the message. The preamble, and I don't care if it's an IS-213 or what, there's a preamble and there's a message. They may not call them that, but that's what it is. Or body is the other word. It's the information needed to track the message. It's who it's from, where it's going, what its priority is, anything that's needed to track the message or get it there is the preamble. Ah, this is a good one. What is meant by the term check in reference to formal traffic message? It's the number of words or word equivalents in the text portion of the message. This heralds back to the CW days where the guy's sitting there listening and write, writing the message. What happens if he misses a word? Uh, I'll give you one. All you familiar with the phrase or the sentence, thou shalt not, ki uh, thou shalt not steal? One of the old versions of the Bible, somebody printed it without the knots in it. Sort of changes the meaning a little bit. Just dropping one word, okay? It is the number of words or word equivalents in the text portion of the message. Oops, I thought I had that in there. I missed it. I have a slide on that. But it, if I take the number of words and count them and then at the end say, check five, if there's five words. The person on the other end gets the message with the words check five at the end, <coughs> they count back. One, two, three, four, five words. I got them all. Is it perfect? No. But it's got a chance to catch a big error. What is the amateur radio service ARES, Aries? Licensed amateurs who have voluntarily registered their qualifications and equipment for communications duty and public service. Does someone want to tell me what is the difference between Aries and Racies? Federal recognition. Federal recognition in the FCC Part 97. And by the way... They're registered somehow through that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, except that there's no civil defense organization anymore to register with. <laughs> yeah, there is. I just came from the Hawaii. Oh, did you? <laughs> Hawaii's emergency management is still called civil defense. Okay. <laughs> but the point is, the point is the two organizations have the same thrust, and the only thing we're doing is having a contest between two groups where, where there are two groups. Thank God... Cumberland started getting things going again. They went with one. Which one? They, it's it's a group called R Aries Racing. Oh, that's how it is back home too. What? That's how it is. Where Where's I'm that? Home, Blair County. Is it okay? That's a. It's Schoolkill area. No, okay. it's it's west. Oh, west. You're, you're over here. It's halfway between here and Pittsburgh. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, Blair, Blaine, and another one. I get confused. Okay. Did I get that? No. Okay. What should you do if another operator reports that your station two meter signals were stock strong just a moment ago and now they're weak or distorted? Believe it or not, this can happen. You can be talking and it, it happens with cell phones. You move your, you turn your head and it goes away, okay? Try moving a few feet or changing the direction of your antenna if possible, as reflections may cause multi-path distortion. 
If a radio signal goes out, hits that wall, and gets to Jack, and the other one's going straight to him, and those peaks and valleys get to him at the same time, they reinforce each other. And if the peak gets to him at the same time the valley does from the other path, they cancel each other out. And you can wind up going from full signal to almost nothing just by moving 14, 15 inches. Try moving a few feet, changing the, the direction. No joke, we had a MCOM down, or a public service event down around Emmitsburg that one of the operators went out and slid the tripod that they had the antenna on about a foot and they went from almost no signal to solid. So this is what, if you know, you do things. If you don't know. And the reason he did it was he realized that from the car with a, with a much inferior antenna, he was getting in, getting into the repeater. He said, let's see if he, he pulls the antenna in. Why might the range of VHF and UHF signals be greater in the winter? This is not a joke. Less absorption by vegetation. Those, those oak leaves and stuff, boy, do they absorb it. Cornfields are bad. That was actually a big problem with the 800 megahertz system oh. in the county. Maple yeah. leaves are quarter wave. They absorb 800 megahertz like you wouldn't believe. They planted it all in the winter. I never thought about the fact that it didn't work with the vegetation. Yeah. Poor propagation study. <laughs> uh -huh. OK, yes. OK, we're going to talk about something here which way the waves go. It's called horizontal and vertical polarization. It's hard to see on that picture, but that antenna has a boom that goes this way and it's got elements that go this way from it. They're horizontal, okay? That's one of those that you stick on your car. It's vertical. The electrical portion of the radio wave Radio waves are electromagnetic, they're both. The electrical portion goes whichever way the antenna goes. So if a wave is put out this way, and you've got an antenna sitting here this way, to pick it up, guess what? You lose about 96 or 98 percent of the signal. Okay. I laugh. We get we get some people with handheld transceivers, and you're familiar with the, with the gangsters that like to turn the pistol sideways. Okay, well they turn the radio sideways, and now we've taken a somewhat marginal system with a low power transmitter, an antenna that's less than ideal, and we're now going to drop 90 percent of the signal again. Yeah. Of that. And all you got to do is keep it this way. But, oh, we have those. Uh, it's a training issue, but the idea is to keep the polarization the same. Typically, FM and the digital modes, we use the vertical polarization because we do it a lot mobile. And an omni antenna, one that goes the whole way around, transmits equally in all directions, is difficult to do horizontal by comparison to vertical. The vertical is naturally omni. That antenna on the other side is horizontal. It's going to have its strongest signal, if you look at what the elements, it's going to have its strongest signal front and back if it was only one element. That's got two, four, five. And they tend to push the signal in one direction only. It might be a cone that wide, but it's going out there. If you think of this like a light bulb sitting in the middle of a room, and this like a flashlight or spotlight, that's kind of the analogy. You're going to get the signal out in one direction. 
I will tell you this, that particular beam is, that's there is actually probably one of the ones that I used in 1960. Or if it's not, it's a very similar model. And uh, I could turn it with the back towards a station that was absolutely loud, clear, and solid. And I could turn it back towards them and just barely and get a signal from them. That's how much change you could get. So why would you want to use a horizontal? Okay. Directional. Directional, number one. Number two, some of the interference characteristics is less with horizontal. Horizontal is typically used with sideband long distance weak signal. This is normally used with FM or the di new digital modes, which are by also FM, but don't tell anybody. They don't like to hear that. But uh, it's used with that. If you think about it, if you're driving in a car, you don't want an antenna that's pointed in one direction. Uh, my home antenna, yeah, I could put one of those up and turn the elements vertically. But then I've got to keep turning it. And I can talk to almost anybody I want to anyway with the single one. Okay. And by the way, I have on one tower a vertical for FM for, for, for three bands. Two, a 70 centimeter, a 2 meter, and a 6 meter beam. And I have the aluminum overcast down on the ground that's getting ready to go up. It's a 16 foot boom, 10 foot elements for 6 meters. Imagine the size of that sucker. Okay. Uh, I'm getting ready for the sunspot spot cycle to come back. What antenna polarization is normally used, okay, this goes to the, what we were just talking about, normally used for long distance, weak signal, CW and SSB contacts on the UHF and VHF bands, horizontal. You use this guy right here. By the way, that is only about a 12 foot boom with 10 foot elements. Imagine what that other one looks like. <laughs> Okay, let's break here for lunch. That's a good place. Uh, try to get back at one, okay? I'll give you a few minutes grace on that. But uh, I need to hit a button here.